bringing things together type stuff. You know, um, as you're studying right now, you're going to bring all the chapters together. And so I actually have some things that are probably more fun than studying for the test. I'll put it at that. I won't say they're fun. They're more fun than studying for the test, okay? But there's things that you can do. Let me show you. So I showed you calcite. I showed you the, uh, the tape and acetate. And corn syrup, of course, will do that. If you take a tube of corn syrup and you do some kind of thing, I don't think this is polarized light at all. I think this is just regular light because the corn syrup itself will make this sort of rainbow. It will actually take the light and reorganize it and sort of act like a prism, but it's just Cairo corn syrup. And that leads to the thing that I can't do myself, but I want to show you from YouTube. And so I think Control Click will do it. No, nope, I'll just copy and paste. All right. So here's video number one. And what did I say to skip to? 250. Okay. Because they set it up, they have this guy talking. Uh, you have to recognize. But I just want to show you what it looks like. All right. As I pour it in, so he has set up polarizing filters the in the bottom, and you see increases. at first when you pour it in, you see the black and white color, but as you pour in more and you get more depth, the centimeters increases that the light is passing through, and then you get some separation with, with the, the different light. wavelengths of light. And if you do it's it in this through. sort of angular sort of way, each of these is rotated slightly, you can see the different wavelengths will rotate differently. Um, and so as you get it deeper, uh, as you get the, the depth deeper, eventually you get one to where you're se effectively separating out all of those different colors, all of the visible spectrum of colors. So what I think he has polarizing filters um, on the top and bottom, I believe, but I definitely know that those, at the bottom he's basically taken these polarizing filters and has just a r rotated them different ways. Different rotations will give you different colors. I've always thought that that was pretty cool, but it would be really hard to set up. Um, this is another one that I just found. If you look at this, then this is made with tape, you know, cut very carefully, and then you rotate the, the polarized light, and this is corn syrup with the tape around the bottle. Or actually, I think the tape is behind it. There might be some tape on the bottle, though. I'm not sure what that is. That's probably refraction. Okay, so I think, I think that artists should take advantage of things like this. And you can see the rotating filter. Do you see it for a second? When you see the, the, the rotating filter is important to be able to see the different wavelengths um, move around and stuff like that. So that's the same thing that we've, we've talked about with sugars, and of course, we can do it as scientists and measure the angles, and that will tell us something about the concentration of the sugar and the identity of the sugar, because different atoms will rotate the light to different degrees, okay? And the one thing is, if you have a solution, the solution is homogeneous, the light's passing through, and it, it turns out that the, the structure of the molecule will rotate the light different amounts. So here's um, something that was I, was, I was going to mention it, and then somebody brought it up to me, and I'm like, I've really got to mention it then. They just found this. It's called an eye motif DNA structure, and they found that it's in the nuclei of human cells. It's in real cells. It doesn't just happen in a test tube. And it happens in places where it looks like it matters. If you look here, we, uh, it's cell cycle dependent, so at certain times they'll form in the cell, cell cycle. It's also pH dependent. And they're found in not just everywhere, but in regulatory regions and promoters and telomeric regions. It looks like this might be getting in the way of some machinery. It might be how the cell regulates whether that gene is there or not. So I want you to look at this and tell me, when I saw that, I immediately said, that looks like something else. What do you think it looks like? What's that? It looks like a tRNA because it's forming the secondary structure, exactly like that. Um, and there's even something you can get a little more specific about what kind of secondary structure it looks like. This is definitely like what Grabo studies, right? 
but um, there's something even a little bit weirder because what he studies is usually just a double helix by itself, like a hairpin and things like that. What does this look like even more than it looks like a hairpin? It looks like something else. What do you see? Yes, the G quadruplex. Because you see four things. It's a quadruhelix or whatever it is. And uh, I didn't even know that DNA could do this, but they show it right here. The quadruplex that we talk about has the guanines coming in, and you have the four uh, strands like that, and you see that th it's like a square. This is kind of like that, but it's actually base pairing, but they're base pairing through each other. I had no idea that DNA could be flexible enough, but it shows you how flexible DNA is. It can actually, what they, the word they use for this is intercalation. It's intercalating when you have something between the base pairs. There's actually drugs that work this way, so I want you to be aware that DNA is so flexible, it can do some weird things. I would not have predicted that it could do this, but it's proving me wrong. And so, you know, I've got to say it can do this because here's the evidence right here. And they're showing it's biologically relevant as well. So even the little thing, I mean, we had a couple slides on the G quadruplex, right? But being able to know that prepares you to be able to know when new stuff comes down, like this, which is just out this year. The other place where biochemistry can really help you is actually in making pi, okay? So you can, I, I don't know how much this will help you in studying before the exam, but maybe it will help you convince your parents that you actually learned something here that's actually useful beyond just amino acid structures. I mean, who needs to know that, right? Well, actually, knowing amino acid structures can help you to understand both the food we eat and the diseases that result from the food we eat. So here, here's an example of that. I really want to read this book. I've never actually read it, but I feel like as a scientist, I can look at the table and I don't have to read the book. So here's the table that's, ma that's mainly about this. Um, this is four different substances and we have, we had lectures about each of these, okay? If you say we had sugars a chapter and we had fat chapter just now, but we have li a liquid lecture, which was like water at the very beginning. Don't forget that uh, the liquid properties of water are very different chemical properties, right? Now the other thing is flour and egg are actually the same category. And it's the one category, the one main category that we really didn't mention. I guess it's not nucleic acids, let's say. So what would flour and egg be? Do I hear protein? Yeah. They're um, protein categories. Different proteins, but those are amino acids, right? And that affects how they work. So if you look at bread, what is bread? It's only flour and water. You know, it's got a little bit of the other stuff mixed in. But primarily, to make bread, you need a 5 to 3 ratio of protein to water. And that's why bread is so sort of uh, um, solid, but it's also kind of airy. You know, the, um, the, the, the water leads to uh, organisms or um, bicarbonate releasing gas, and that inflates the bread as it goes through. So you can think about all this. The water gets turned into air pockets because when it boils, the liquid turns into gas. Okay, so we have those different categories. Both of these are protein categories. And so you can see that to make a muffin, what you do is you're almost like making bread, but you have a little less protein overall, and some of the protein is egg. And then the other thing that makes muffins good? You have one part of fat in there, okay? So that makes muffins kind of buttery. You've got to add that. So if you, if you look at, um, and I want you to compare, like, um, so a biscuit is like a muffin, except that you've moved one of the units of egg to turn it into flour. A biscuit is like a muffin, but it's got a little more of the bread wheat protein than the egg protein, the eggy protein. Cookie, on the other hand, we've moved one more thing. So it's got less liquid. It's got the same three units of flour protein, but what makes cookies so good? They're bottom heavy on this particular uh, way of showing things. They, sh they have a lot of sugar and they have a lot of fat. In fact, cookie has the most sugar. That's why uh, we love it so, you know, sugar and fat. And definitely it's the one that you, you can eat different amounts of these things as a result too because you're taking in these different categories of molecules. But I really want to look at pi because pi is it's kind of interesting. It's kind of, uh, 
what does it have less of? If you go across this, it has less of one category in particular. Um, it definitely has less sugar. In fact, I would say that a cookie is the only one that has uh, sugar. What, do, what is something that everything else tends to have? Uh, yeah, pi has less liquid, and so it has fewer air pockets, right? But also, pi has more fat. So it's, instead of having air, it's going to have more butteriness. It's going to be more like a muffin. You know, it's um, more like a cookie, actually. It's just like a less sweet cookie. Okay? So you can think about these. And, you know, bread recipes have always been really mysterious to me. You know, my mom would never make bread growing up because uh, she, we lived in Florida and she didn't want to get the house hot by having the oven on all the time. In this climate, it's actually advantageous to have the oven on all the time. But I want you to, to I want to talk about what that protein is doing and why, what the extra fat in the pie is doing to make pie crust different than the other kinds of bread. So the wheat protein that we're talking about in flour is gluten. Everyone knows that now, but it's actually, at, at the structural level, not everyone knows this. Gluten is actually two proteins, gliadin and glutenin, mostly. Everything I'm saying is mostly. You know, this is not precise. This is what we figured out, okay? Um, so it's mixed with water, the liquid, and it's kneaded together. And so the proteins actually make something, when you knead bread, what happens to it? You, the powdery flour turns into something that, at least to me, feels mostly like a rubbery balloon. It turns, it's still a solid, but it's kind of uh, pliable. And you, the whole thing with kneading it, you're actually doing a protein refolding reaction on the bread. And this is the paper that you can turn to, to look at it. They looked at bread before it was kneaded and after it was kneaded. So here's a scanning electron microscope that you can take, freshly wetted dough. And so this is completely flat and homogeneous, but it's not been kneaded yet. This is just mixed together. And you can see it's just, there's no structure to it at all. Notice how flat and amorphous the gluten appears to be. On the right is an SEM image of kneaded dough. And after kneading, you have an alignment into very structured fibers. And so by doing this to the bread, you are actually creating fibers in the bread. Those fibers happen at several different levels. Like most of the fibers that we talk about, they actually happen at multiple levels. They're at the atomic level, they're at the um, microscopic level. And uh, you can actually see if you talk about what is bread actually doing, well, you start off with a protein like this, and then you sort of unfold it. But before you unfold it all the way, it finds another protein to self-associate, and what does that remind you of? Yeah, beta sheets. And where do we, what diseases did we talk about that were associated with this exact kind of mechanism? Yeah, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, um, the fibrils that we talked about. In fact, you formed a little fibril that was a little bit like this when we went out on that rainy, cold day and everyone forgot their jacket and got really cold and we were just trying to get back in as quick as we can. But so it's that kind of thing. Uh, you can actually see some levels of these fibers. If you take French bread, though, and look at it and, like, peel off this outside, you can see it's got this spaghetti-like fiber on the inside. In fact, spaghetti is probably another form of this kind of fiber. So you have all these fibers, and when you knead it, uh, and the thing is, these are held together. These are not held together with hydrogen bonds. They're held together with weak bonds that you can change by mechanically kneading the bread. And you can change them and form those fibrils. They're held together with disulfides and hydrophobic interactions, and also backbone hydrogen bonds. All of those are weak, and they're protein folding kind of things. The strongest thing is a disulfide. And uh, that is like the limit of what you can mechanically break. You can't break a covalent bond in general by just kneading bread. And so you're reorganizing the weak interactions. And so what they did is they actually did size exclusion chromatography of wheat gliadin. And they have uh, two different styles. They have gliadin with, uh, w that has been treated with heat and pressure. And, but, and then they have gliadin that they added the glycerol to. They needed the glycerol so it would go through the column. Uh, or 
actually, it would go through the column without the glycerol, but the glycerol sort of made it go through the column better, okay? Because you can see without the glycerol, you get a lot of stuff coming out here, uh, one major peak. But what's all this? Is this, what, how do you interpret this peak that's on the side of, of, you get most of the protein coming out like this. What's all this stuff right here? It comes out first. Therefore, what do you know about it on size exclusion? It's going to be bigger. So it's the network that is bigger. If you add the glycerol, it takes these polymeric proteins that are sort of glommed together, and it makes them monomeric. And this is the size that you would expect if you look at the size of the proteins themselves. So the proteins tend to be these monomeric units, but in bread dough, some of them are tangled up. The more you knead it, the more they tangle up together, and the more polymeric proteins you create. I think if you uh, kneaded it a little bit more, you would see this increase and that decrease. So they were, but they were able to actually look at the monomer, because they want to look at the untangled version of this. And they were able to actually get the structure. And you know, the structure is kind of complex. You see alpha and beta structure right there. And you can see there's lots of domains with different levels of organization. And this is, um, this is all, basically you can see that there's, there's angstroms here. You can see that when you add, when you take this monomer and you treat it with heat and pressure, the monomer starts to stick together. And some of these parts are sort of unfolded. They unfold and they tangle together. So we can actually see which amino acids are coming together. We can actually connect this, what's going on with bread, to the structure. But you see that you're putting the units together. You're affecting the quaternary structure. You're also affecting the tertiary structure because you see it's all messed up, like right here. But uh, you still have the tertiary structure formed on the outside. And that's what you're doing. This is what kneading bread does to the protein. Now, when you eat bread, like the different proteins get broken down into different fragments. And here is a gliadin peptide fragment that it gets broken down to. And I want you to look at this, just look at it with a sense of what is unusual. What do you see more of than you normally expect to see, especially of the most unusual types of amino acids? Generally speaking, it's, what is it? It's less than 20, it's about, maybe it's about 20 or less amino acids long. So that means on average you should see about one of every average amino acid. The ones that are, um, that are less common, you should see zero or one. There is a less common amino acid that you actually see more than one of. Which is it? And it will be something that might make it harder to break down. What do you see, Mirka? Yeah, so you see a lot of those. Those will make it soluble. And those, um, those also are sort of normal amino acids, you know? I, I don't remember what the uh, abundances are, but you, you might see a few more of those. That makes it nice and soluble. But there's something that makes it hard to break down. And that's the, that's the unusual thing. You want to have a hypothesis for what could do that. Hannah, where do you see the prolines? Oh yeah, there's three. I, I only saw two when I was looking at it earlier, so uh, I, I missed one of them. Three prolines is really weird. You know, you expect to see maybe one. And so this fragment, remember that prolines are going to completely change. They're going to completely cover up the amide bond, for one thing. If you have a protease, it's not really going to work really well on, on prolines. You need a specific site to be able to break the backbone there. Maybe that's why I should have said, I should have said, look at what w is different about the protein backbone here. This is one of the reasons why this protein is hard for people to digest. It doesn't get broken down as easily, and therefore you do have gluten intolerance as a result. There's a lot of other things going on, but gluten tolerance is, um, and gluten intolerance is related to a structural hypothesis that these prolines are what make it so hard to break down. The prolines also probably make the bread protein be the kind of thing that you can knead, and will, uh, the prolines probably affect how the bread protein works in the first place. So there you go. Gluten uh, intolerance does have a structural relationship. Now the thing is we've talked about 
the protein part, then you also have the fats and the sugars you can mix in. Sugar is really soluble. It's not going to do much to the structure. But fat is going to react with the structure in interesting ways that's not going to boil away, you know. Um, and also, we know that fats will stick to fats, and they'll avoid sticking to proteins. So you have the oil and water type thing going on. Zach? They, uh, it's going to be broken up, but if you produce a lot of this fragment, then that's going to accumulate in some people, and some people might be less able to deal with the, the accumulated fragment. You're talking about a percentage difference rather than an absolute here, but you can see that this would make the percentage difference of this, this would be harder for a protease to chew up. Hopefully most of it would pass through the system, but the, if it accumulates, it can actually cause problems. So the thing is, if you, you can use oil to separate the gluten strands in cool ways. In bread, you just form a big balloon of the gluten, and you inflate it by cooking it. The air expands, and it blows up like a balloon and becomes bread. In croissants, has anyone ever made a croissant? I never have, but I've heard about it. Tell me if I'm wrong, OK? But you make a layer and then you put the butter on it, and then you fold it over, right? And then you put butter on that, and you fold it over again, and butter on that, and you fold it over again. You make all these layers of protein, fat, protein, butter, protein, butter. And so it's layers, hydrophobic layers, that are separating the more hydrophilic proteins. Therefore, you have a more ordered arrangement. It's like having stacks of balloons rather than one big balloon or balloons that are interspersed throughout. You're organizing the way that the balloons can, uh, the, the liquid can form into gas. And you're organizing the protein by using the hydrophobic layers of oil. And I think that if you just do it a, a, a certain number of times, like eight or nine times, you get like thousands of layers. And that's where the layers in the croissant come from. They've been created by the butter. Butter also tastes good. So this is all good chemistry. You know, I've, I've sort of wondered if we could do an entire chemistry class in the kitchen, you know? But um, they don't let me in the kitchen uh, across the way, but I'll have to talk about them. I'm sure they will if I make a good enough case, okay? So pie dough is like halfway to a croissant. But instead of making layers, you're going to cut butter into the flour using one of these things. I don't know what the name for this is. Does this have a name? flower cutting device, okay? <laughs> but what you do is you, you just sort of mash it in and you make all these granules that then you roll out and you make into the pie crust and things like that. Each of these granules is little bubbles of protein coated with lipids. It's like a little, instead of being flat layers, it's the same kind of thing, but you have enough butter there that the protein is encased in the butter and you these little bubbles of protein, which also have water in them. So what you do is you coat the flour with butter, and then you're supposed to streak the dough, which will arrange them in, so that they are more dispersed throughout, but they still retain their little flour bubble floating in a sea of butter kind of idea. It isn't fully laminated as a result, but it's croissant-like because it has Instead of layers of protein, flat layers, it has little bubbles of protein that are surrounded by fat. And that is what makes it flaky, kind of like a croissant. Okay. All right, so that's a lot of stuff, but you've done lipid and sugar experiments before if you've made cookies. And the chemistry of cookies is in this TED video. Okay. My goal, now I want to really look back and I want to say, what have you, where have you come? You know, we've done a lot of different, uh, different testing things. And now we're going to bring it all together. So now we want to return to these product labels. Before with organic chemistry, you understood some of this, so you, like you could understand that the octadecanal aldehyde that has 18 carbons associated with it, you know? But now you, you've got the amino acids down. Now you've got the fatty acids down a little bit more. You even have 
eicosanoid acids, and remember that we said that that means what? What does eicos mean? Miracle can't answer because it's Greek, right? So anyways, <laughs> but, but it's, uh, it's eicos means 20. Yeah, so. Um, but the, you, have the, uh, you have the same things with a different arrangement in the banana. You have fatty acids. You have, um, you have all the different chemicals that come together. And so hopefully now these make a little more sense. And in the same way, the um, actual labels might have a little more, uh, little more examples in them. So there we, there we have it. All right, so I want to bring back, there's actually a paper that came out. Remember that we talked about how you exhale into the environment metabolic products that then that show what your internal state is because those products are related to muscle movement and thoughts and things like that. And so we had the thing with the Hunger Games and they measured at the two scenes, two dramatic scenes, they saw spikes of different compounds. They saw spikes of CO2 and um, isoprene, I think, was one of the molecules. You haven't talked about where isoprene comes from yet. That's next quarter. But it's a product of metabolism. So what they did is they actually took this, they took this and they said, what did different movies do to their audience? And so they have the same Hunger Games movie, but they put it in a 12-year-old category. And then they had the different audiences that were showing up for the different categories. Now, the one thing to realize for this, they were not taking little kids and putting them to see paranormal activity, okay? These are the normal age distributions. So for the 16 and up grade category, you actually expect all of those people to be adults. You know, maybe a few snuck in, but they're not changing the data very much. But for the younger ones, you have much younger audiences. And what they found is interesting is on average, you, got, you get more of these exhalations, more isoprene being exhaled. If you measure it for the whole thing, for example, for the Hunger Games, you have those two scenes that makes the isoprene come out of the audience. They can detect that. And they've detected that if you see, help, I've shrunk my teacher, which apparently is not as stressful as Hunger Games, um, you get less isoprene from the audience, even though a younger audience, by default, should be putting out more isoprene if everything else is equal. So this is working against the trend of the youth of the audience. And so they, they actually would say, they talk about isoprene a little bit here. It's actually stored in muscle tissue. And um, if you move muscles, isoprene will enter the bloodstream, and then it will vent through the, the breath. And so what this means is that there's, what's the biological word for like the stress response, like you, when you're stressed and your muscles, what's that? Yeah, the fight or flight. And there's like, a, like, like we have, um, fight or flight definitely works for, for, your muscles are getting ready to move, right? Because of that, they're releasing the isoprene, and you breathe it out. And so even though you know that you aren't taking part in the Hunger Games, you're being empathetic with those who are taking part in the Hunger Games, and your muscles are sort of getting ready for that, and it's releasing the isoprene like this. Yeah, it's actually a molecule. You'll find out about it next quarter. Um, uh, it's a molecule that's used to build other molecules. So it's actually how you build cholesterol, for one thing. But it's, uh, it's stored in muscles. But when, you, when the muscles freak out, it like, I don't know if it sends a signal or if it's just that they don't need it anymore. But it comes out of the muscles when they start to move around. And being stressed out, breathing more, e breathing requires muscles, right? You know, So if you're breathing faster, you actually will release more isoprene. And it turns out that isoprene is actually, the, they tested several things, and they tested CO2, and they all sort of went up, but isoprene was really the specific, when you're like stressed and your muscles are shaking more, then isoprene will come out. Okay, so um, they, they actually were looking through this. Uh, suspense, okay, Help I've Shrunk My Teacher has fewer suspense scenes in both films, okay? Suspense scenes generally lead to increased heart and breathing rates, involuntary movement, you know, paranormal. Didn't, didn't they advertise paranormal activity with a thing showing the audience in the dark and they, they had the people like jumping when the thing that you, and you're like, oh, I want to do that, you know? And so you go to the movie for this suspense and you're releasing isoprene. The really interesting idea 
maybe we can use isoprene to objectively classify films. And we can say this is a PG-13 because it causes a lot of isoprene to be released. And this is a PG because the audience did not release as much isoprene on average. I kind of like that because I know I've been next to my kids in a movie and I'm just like, this is a cool movie, and they're like freaking out. You know, but if they're, <laughs> you, you can measure how much they're freaking out and you can say, okay, this is too much isoprene. You aren't old enough to watch this yet. You know? Um, and that would be nice because you're saying that the isoprene is making the decision, not you, and so it turns into the bad guy. You, you don't have to be the bad guy. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of interesting, to, uh, an interesting idea of objectively rating movies by isoprene release. Okay, so, and when we're looking at these other things, there's just one last thing I want to mention to bring things together. Uh, when you look at any paper, you're going to be bringing multiple things together. This is fluorescent cells but these are biochemicals that are causing the different colors. And you can tell one thing, like I can tell you that these fluorescent molecules, they, they come from some kind of UV bond conjugation, because that's where colors come from. Fluorescent colors, just like regular colors. And then you can arrange them into a wreath. Then I got a Merry Christmas from a peptide synthesis company, and so they were saying, you can see the alpha helix, and you can even see the different uh, amino acids. They assume you know that. If you know this stuff, you can go and you can order from this catalog as part of your job, and um, you can actually get paid to work with biochemistry. So this is useful knowledge, and then you can send your friends a Merry Christmas card with a hidden biochemistry message in it. Maybe it spells out something if you actually look at the amino acids. I haven't ever checked. But the other thing that I wanted to do for Christmas is there's these things. Remember that lipids will form you know, hollow vesicle-like things, and they'll be very complex, they'll self-organize, and so you have the lipid rafts and stuff like that. The people who study this, they throw the lipids into water, they see how they organize, they can make different lipids fluorescent, just like you can make one red and one green and things like that, and you get different things like this. Just by throwing different lipids together, these were not pieced together, these happen spontaneously with the lipids in water, and it's usually two or three lipids in water, and they look like Christmas ornaments to me. I would love to have a line of glass Christmas ornaments that recreated this. And they're even red and green because those are the fluorescent colors that are easiest to get. Um, it leads to problems for the colorblind reading it, so now we're moving away from depicting it this way. But um, you can see it's Christmas colors. Here's one. This is ceramid and cholesterol and gly glycerophospholipid. You can, these are all molecules that you know, if I haven't asked you to memorize them, you can at least recognize them. The SAR is a ceramid-rich domain, and there is nothing else, there's no star mold. This came out from ceramid touching ceramid and wanting to get away from the cholesterol or whatever, you know? This is pretty amazing. It looks like the little Pixar ball, actually, but it looks like a Christmas ornament. And it comes about from the self-organizing of the lipids, and don't forget they're in water. The water is probably doing most of the interesting chemistry here. The lipids are sort of getting out of its way. What's going on is they study it, and you see that when you first mix it together, you can have the, all the mo different molecules dispersed, but then they'll reorganize to put like all these dark gray molecules over here, all the light gray and red molecules over there, and you'll get a polka dotted thing. So polka dots don't usually happen, but they do happen all the time when you have lipids in water. So polka dots don't happen, you know, an animal can make a polka dot through a complex genetic mechanism. But chemistry can make polka dots just by mixing stuff together. So again, yay chemistry, right? The thing about these is these even appear to sort of pulse, and I don't want to use the word live, but they dynamically oscillate, okay? They, they could fool someone into thinking that they look alive. If you just take this in an isotonic solution, so basically a certain salt, salt solution, and you move it to hypotonic. So hypotonic, what did you just do to the salt? It's lower, right? Hypotonic, so you put in a lower salt solution. The osmotic pressure makes the water wants to seep in, and some of the water can squish itself in, depending on the strength of the lipids that are going on. And what you see is you don't just see the balloon blow up in all the cases. Sometimes you see a cycle form where like polka dots will form and then water will move, let's see, uh, water will move out, it's showing what, like pressure will build up 
and then the pressure will be released, and it will return to the solid red, and then the polka dots will form again, and they'll move around. In other words, you've taken this cool sort of bubble, you've thrown it, you've just changed the salt concentration. And as it reaches equilibrium, the osmotic pressure equilibrates, but it doesn't equilibrate all at once, it does it in steps. And in fact, what it can do is it can actually go through steps that they will wind down over time, but it's like a wind-up toy, and it will sort of like uh, organize and then unorganize, organize and unorganize, and it will make these really cool looking spots. And so I want to show you the videos, one, three, seven, and eight. Here's the paper, it's open access, and you can see that they, if you just look at these under the microscope, you can see these amazing sort of nested structures, and you see the polka dot sort of structures there. Here's more polka dots. Let's um, get to the videos, though, because the videos are what's going to be really cool. All right. So here's a, a video one, three, seven, and eight I think we wanted to do. So you can see here the organization. I believe this is moved. This is, oh, actually, this is just sitting there. The, but it shows you that even just sitting there is not just sitting there. It looks alive, doesn't it? Again, what's alive here, in any sense, is the movement of water. I, I think I wanted to show you video three. So if you have a bunch of these around, you can see that they affect each other. Like one will cause polka dots to form in the next one, and you see the polka dots are sort of moving around. It's all fluid. It's just a two-dimensional oil fluid that is um, being pushed around by water. Then you have seven right here. You can see that there are pores that form up. When we said that the pressure builds up and then it gets released, this is what it looks like. So it's kind of like, uh, okay, test time, the cell freaks out, but then after test time, relax, it's back to vacation. Okay, but the water can move in and out. The, um, these are held together by hydrophobic interactions. Those are not the strongest interactions. But because they're not the strongest, that means they can be dynamic, and they can change in ordered patterns like this. Here's one last one. And you can, th here's where, where you can see like the polka dots forming, and then popping out, and then popping in again. Doesn't this, if I showed you this, and I said these are live cells that we fluorescently labeled, you would believe me, right? You know, um, but they aren't live cells. They're just lipids in water, and it's actually a chemically defined, relatively pure solution. Just three or four things in there, and it will do behavior like this. So I just want to, oh yeah, that's, that's the thing. Look at it real quickly. Watch, it, watch the beginning. See that one budded out. You even had sort of a daughter vesicle that comes out of this one. And uh, so the, the miracle of birth. There we go. <laughs> It's really just chemistry, right? But my point is, there is no such thing as just chemistry, okay? Um, one last uh, thing about ordering. I mentioned that you can store DNA in glass, and there's actually a BioRad kit that will let you take your DNA and uh, purify it, because it just takes a little alcohol to purify out the DNA from your cheek swab or whatever, and you can encase it in glass. And then, in, in the future, they can probably take that and clone you or something like that. But um, that's, they actually have that. And I just found this, atomic seeds, irradiated with intense gamma radiation. We talked about gamma radiation, right? So what kind of mutations will you have? Well, you plant the seeds, and the first thing you see is they have mutations that cause lots of different colors. But they also occasionally have mutations that cause different structures in the plant as well. And technically, one of these seeds could have a mutation no one's ever seen before, an unlikely mutation that just happened in that seed. And then you can grow the plant, and you can see maybe one of it would turn into like the little shop of horrors, Audrey or whatever. You know, uh, I, I doubt that would happen, but you can tell the person that you're giving it to, you don't know what will happen. It's an experiment to actually grow these UV irradiated or gamma irradiated seeds. If they're gamma irradiated, what kind of DNA problems do they have? Yeah, the thymine, the thymers especially, like the, the, um, the thymine cyclobutyl dimers, I believe. So the other thing is you can you just all put it together. There's this, I just want to mention this one guy, James Torr, who really, his research is taking these and puts it all together. 
he makes this organic molecule. It doesn't look like it does much, but it actually will rotate. And he puts these different groups on it, but the same thing is you have this organic molecule. He's an organic chemist. So what good is this molecule? It actually will fly up to a membrane. It will associate with the phosphate head groups. And then it will start to rotate. When you add light, it'll make it rotate. When it rotates, it burrows into the membrane and breaks it down, makes a little pore right there. That right there is a molecular machine that can interact with the lipid bilayer. James Tour is a Christian. He's part of the American Scientific Affiliation, which is a group of scientists who are Christians. It's much more clear to say that than to say a group of Christian scientists, because that actually means like a church type thing. But um, this is actually a, but it's, it's kind of interesting uh, to look at a scientist who is, he might win the Nobel Prize one day because he's made these little nano cars. He makes these nano devices. And he talks about how important his faith is when he faces rejection for a grant. You know, you don't think that these kind of people face rejection for the grant, but they actually are talking about these things. And I've, I found the American Scientific Affiliation is a really cool what place. Also, they are describing their work to other scientists, not other chemists. And so they use a lot of, um, they explain it better. You get better explained talks at the American Scientific Affiliation than at the ACS, for example. And so then you can build things like this. This is printed uh, droplet networks. Uh, I'm just going to show you this real fast. But this is also based on you have two tubes that you actually print out in an oil solution. You print out single layer vesicles. See how that's sort of reversed? Uh, or it's incomplete. I won't say it's reversed. When you print these out in oil, they can form bilayers by going next to each other. But each of them is a little compartment only separated by hydrophobic interactions. And so you can print this out because you can determine the order in which you put like the red ones next to the blue ones. And you can print out these little devices that have like the blue ones are all together here, the red ones are all together there, and they don't dissolve in each other. You know, they, these are gels that are made up of these stacked together things, and they have little channels that are distinct from each other. It's a, a lot like a tissue in the body. And so they show you right here, you can make them in any pattern you want. You can make a little sphere. You can make a little path through the sphere of orange. And you can hold it in a little, uh, a little um, spoon type thing, you know, and it will hold together. If you have something that has, if you add hemolysin, remember what hemolysin was, a pore forming protein. So what it's going to do is it's going to make big holes in the membrane. But you have hemolysin only in the green ones. If you take the green ones, and you, uh, but it will form a path because the pore will be an opening in the membrane. And that path will be something that electricity can flow through. If you make this square like this, you make a little path with the hemolysin. You put electrodes at both ends of the path, you get a current. If you put an electrode not at the other end of the path, you don't get a current. The electricity can't flow through this but it can flow through that. Oh, and they show you it right here. They, all the hemolysin will mean that all the green ones are connected. All the non-green ones are not. So this is a really cool way to make like uh, liquid circuits you know, out of gels and things like that. And here's another thing with osmosis. If you put high osmolarity next to low osmolarity, okay, then the high osmolarity will swell up and the low osmolarity will shrink. Well, if you do that in a whole layer like this, you'll end up with a self-curving molecule. And if you do it in a whole like four-leaf clover arrangement like this, it will curl up and form this thing. Now, people who've watched too many sci-fi movies, does this remind you of anything? Alien egg, exactly. That's what it reminds me of, too. So I, I, wouldn't want, I would probably have changed the colors so I wouldn't be reminded of alien eggs too much. But there you go. This is a chemical arrangement that by itself closes up because of the osmolarity difference, because of the way water and lipids work. All right. Enough fun. Um, yeah, exactly. Alien eggs. I'm going to cut.